Um, good afternoon. I'm Valerie Cassell Oliver. I'm senior curator here and the organizing curator of Jenny Jones, Jenny C. Jones compilation. Uh, we're really thrilled. Thank you. Thank you. We're really thrilled to have you with us this evening and on behalf of our director, Bill Arning, and our entire board of directors uh, and trustees, we are really just thrilled to have you, Jenny, in your first survey exhibition of 10 years. Um, this was a wonderful journey. We started talking about this exhibition, I want to say two years yeah. ago. Uh, the original iteration was to be something very site-specific in our Zulka gallery downstairs. and. As we talked and as we sort of ruminated on the many years of practice and the, the various uh, modes of production, it became obvious that this was really a golden opportunity to really show the real breadth of your work. And I'm just so honored that we were able to do this together. Um, so it's loosely, we've organized it loosely chronologically. And um, so I think we should start at the beginning, yeah. which is here on the west side of the gallery, east side of the gallery, uh, with the early drawings. So let's, let's start with that. So the exhibition starts 2004 and uh, goes up until 2015 with yeah. the new suite, suite of uh, blue paintings. But let's talk about the beginning and let's talk about the works on paper and let's talk about this beautiful phrase that you talk about, which is listening as a conceptual practice. It's a lot of things at one yeah. time. Um, the earliest works uh, uh, starting on the far end here were made um, in Paris at an artist residency um, in 2004 at the Cité des Arts. And I, I left New York on, on a mission to also see what the residue of uh, African-American jazz uh, was like in Paris in a contemporary setting, if there was any of that sort of expat energy left to be explored. And uh, I had been making mainly drawings uh, because I didn't have a studio space. And also Paris was a chance to, to quit my job and focus on my work. And um, so I, I, we had quite a lot of drawings to go through together. And uh, Valerie uh, is really good at highlighting and picking spots that would sort of weave together uh, this narrative that leads into the paintings. So initially the drawings were really looking at um, the materials that we use to listen, s speakers, equipment, and I very sparse hand, um, and my approach really uses the, well, line as metaphor, f wire as metaphor for how things are connected, <laughs> cultural connections, uh, and disconnections and uh, conduits and cultural, sort of cultural clusters and how they break out and relate to each other. Um, so the first works are um, Speak from 2004. These were also in P Paris around 2004 or five. And then we lead into really looking at equipment sort of more by decade. And this series is, is called Solid State and it's looking at sort of all of the wood paneled, all the heavy pieces of furniture and, and um, in that sense, uh, I'm interested also in that connection to Dada and uh, looking at commonplace objects as, as art objects. So the things that we interact with in our daily lives can actually be seen as beautiful as sculptures. Um, so deconstructing them into a series of, of collage. I've always worked in a series, which ties in nicely to where we'll end up, which is looking more at pages and um, the, the term graphic score, which we can talk about. Uh, more extensively later. So we go from solid state in the 70s sort of down to the Walkman uh, collages of the 80s. There's a, the Sony and the Sanyo. Um, and this ties also into the uh, a sound piece uh, where, where I am using a cassette player on auto reverse and sort of doing really kind of punk rock analog mixing with a cassette player and then digitally manipulating manipulating that as well, so the cross-pollination between this analog and, and digital. 
And there's also this wonderful cross-pollination, or parallelism, I should say, when you're looking at collage, because sound has always been a really important element, a central element uh, to the work. And Jenny also works in sound. So toward the end of the gallery, um, there is a listening room in which we have 14 tracks, which also sort of filters into this notion of collage. But as we get over there, we'll, we'll also talk about that. Um, so sound equipment uh, and the packaging thereof, because mm -hmm. a lot of these collages are taken yeah. from magazines, um, mo or mutates from the idea of packaging to the actual idea of things in the sound studio um, becomes um, material and fodder for um, for creating new ways of of talking about these histories yeah. and um, the arcane nature of of sound and how we not sound but how we listen to sound, yes. uh, which mutates into using acoustic panels. Right. So, can you talk about that's a huge leap. It was a huge leap, and I think it was a critical leap and an important one. And it, it culminated for me at an exhibition I had in 2011 at uh, The Kitchen, which has a, a great legacy of experimentation and multidisciplinary work. Uh, George Lewis, who wrote the essay for the wonderful book that we put together in conjunction with this show, um, he contributed an essay, but he was also the director of The Kitchen in the 80s, which I found out I later on that. talking to him. Yeah. So The Kitchen, uh, and struggling, you know, I'm really always maybe too transparent, but struggling with being a conceptual artist, with being a woman of color, how, how I start to uh, push-pull relationship with the, the commercial galleries in New York and with the market when you're talking about such um, intangible things. I think all conceptual artists struggle with that. And for me, going back to canvas and going back to making object-based work after about a decade of staying pretty much in the realm of prints, drawings, and sound, I felt um, very much focused uh, on, the, on the idea that the work had to be connected, and it really came together in the kitchen show because sound in these big empty white box spaces is always a, a struggle. It floats, it dissipates, and actually the way I was editing early sound pieces w was to lean into the space and to make pieces like the 433 cage, mm -hmm. slowly caged in a silent way, which is a very ambient piece and would actually be better in a space that's echoey and floating. So the absorber panels, um, not only became a way to return to canvas, to return to bigger objects, to leave the safety of my small scale paper and really, really be more ambitious, but um, conceptually the material was perfect because it, it was connected uh, to the sound in the space and it was affecting the sound in the space as well. So they're working, um, they're paintings, but they're also working and they're working in tandem with the sound in the room. And I also have to say I love that they're working without sound in the room, that they are dampening even the human voice and they're softening and having a presence uh, in the space even if it's a, a quiet, passive, passive one. But even as it deadens the room, it also enlightens the room and it, it has a reverb quality to it. Um, and I think when we talk about the production of these, the pops of color, because I think by introducing color into this, it almost as if there is something emanating, there's an energy um, that's emanating from these works. And um, even if you look at the top edges or in this uh, larger vertical piece, the sort of reverberation which is happening between them. So I'm really, well, I'm not curious because I, I, I think there's this nature that sound never leaves. As much as you're moving into the visual realm, um, there is a sort of uh, an ability to capture something that's almost intangible through these sort of reverberating um, pops of color and the fact that they're actually vibrating. They're yeah. allowing the I mean, visual... As soon as you start talking about acoustics and architecture, it really quickly, I, I can only take my nerdiness so far, but it really quickly goes into the realm of physics, and that immediately connects to um, how c color uh, vibrates and bounces, and it's always only hot colors, so it's always only the reds and yellows that have this intensity to respond against a, a white 
wall. But once you start really looking at that, you can see that even the black above has just a soft mm -hmm. uh, denseness or a white painting. So it's, it's, it happens, but I wanted to um, find a way for them to hum um, and to have that visual connection through optics in the same way that I was beginning to investigate sonic and sound in a physical space. Mm -hmm. And let's talk quickly about the tritone because that will allow us to then move yeah. into the next room. You focus on the tritone which you talk about these particular pops of color that have the ability to reverberate. Um, red, which uh, was the series that you did at the kitchen. Mm -hmm. uh, and then at the Hirschhorn, uh, we moved into the yellow. And then uh, this particular exhibition culminates with the blue. So let's move into the yellow and talking about higher resonance at the Hirschhorn Museum and the works created for that and the works created in the, the intervening time. Hey, Jesse. Hi, Jesse. Hi, Jesse. And I really have to give it up to the crew Absolutely. here at the Contemporary Arts Museum who did such an extraordinary job in uh, installing this exhibition. We have such a fine group of people who work with us all the time. And uh, there's Paul and Jesse and Kenya and um, so many, Jonathan and uh, Jeff Shore, who's our head preparator, who uh, basically worked with us to design this installation. So we have an amazing crew here. Um, but no, I'm yeah. yeah super grateful. It was very it, everything dovetailed together quite easily this week with without hiccups. So it was a great a great week. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the all the yellow and gray pieces uh, were in an exhibition called Higher Resonance at the Hirschhorn in 2013. It was my first solo museum uh, exhibition curated by Evelyn Hankins. And um, she's actually the curator, the modernist curator there, and not the contemporary curator. So we were able to really get into um, my interest in repositioning and reframing how it is we tell our, the history of modernism in America and who is excluded and who is included in the birth of modernism in America. And we cannot, uh, we, we can't claim that term without talking about the, the revolution of, that happened with music um, at mid-century. Um, and I often felt that they were um, excluded from that conversation and excluded uh, from the white box and the canon in that way. So um, it's interesting, it's almost like a, a fast forward because the very early pieces, I literally went chronologically educating myself, weaving in and out of things that I knew from my parents' record collection mm -hmm. and things that I just loved and instinctively gravitated to. But Higher Resonance, t went, uh, the title worked on many levels. The yellow was about high vibration. Uh, I wanted to make a very a light, uplifting, uh, space. We built a, a curved wall for that exhibition that functioned like an architectural intervention and created sort of a mini amphitheater. The Hirschhorn is a round building and the, all the galleries are curved except for the Ellsworth Kelly. Right. They, he, they said he made them <laughs> make a straight, straight wall line, yes. just for his, <laughs> his one piece. It's the only square in that building. Um, but to respond to the architecture in the same way that sound was going to respond to the space it was, it was in. But content-wise, that exhibition, I was editing sound, uh, very heavy instrumental sound for the first time. I started off with language mm -hmm. and almost creating poems. What would a hundred Billie Holiday songs sound like? What would three or four scat songs? And this is, mind you, 11 years ago, so the term mashup wasn't there. Right. And I was really honestly thinking of as the form of collage. Um, but higher resonance was more about layering um, con a conceptual framework that would look not only at, at higher registered notes and tones and bells and whistles and all of the little crumbs, but to also look at the more avant-garde um, our, um, musicians and composers um, and extending that conversation into the realm of Wendell Logan or, or Ollie Wilson and guys that were informed by jazz but then went on to be uh, to teach at Oberlin and were really interested in symphonic work and sort of coming more out of the third stream which was this attempt at being a hybrid between jazz and classical which 
doesn't work really because of the improvisation will we'll leave the page more often than, than stay confined in that traditional way of working with uh, symphony. So anyway, huh, that's what I mean about digression. I'm like, Valerie, pull me out of it. <laughs> As I said, all I have to do is rind her up and let her go. I mean, it, it really is an amazing tale of the two avant-garde's and the fact that they were created as two avant-garde's and uh, even though they fed off of one another, um, our canons uh, really do not uh, allow um, a space where they come together. Uh, they never really function as a, st a seamless narrative. Yeah. And I think what you've created so beautifully and eloquently in the work is that, um, is that uh, consistent seamless narrative of minimalism, modernism, both in sound and in, um, in the visual realm. So, um, and I think it was so beautifully installed at the Hirshhorn. I did have the opportunity to see it. So um, that was a big coming out party. Was, yeah. <laughs> and the wonderful. government shutdown happened, so yes, the show was true. closed. <laughs> reopen anyway. shortly. Um, do you want to talk about, too, uh, this movement into the sculptural objects uh, with the base traps? Yeah. Well, uh, materials, obviously, uh, I, I like to find materials that can sort of do some of the heavy lifting conceptually. And these were found, meaning found, I, I got them from a guy who built them uh, for his sound studio at home in the basement in California and he was gutting his space and they popped up on eBay and I'd never seen uh, bass traps with such uh, intention behind their design. Uh, these are usually uh, mounted up in, in the corners of the room for in a room to kind of uh, to absorb low end um, and trap. I mean that's the the title. And so uh, I just basically re refinished the surfaces and sanded them down and put feet on the bottom and, and used them as something else. And, and apologies if you were here yesterday, but w I was talking about Duchamp and how I feel that Duchamp has had a bigger influence on contemporary art and conceptual art. And when I was going through school, there was such a heavy emphasis on, you know, on, on uh, Matisse and Picasso as the cornerstone, which then the cornerstone is actually African sculpture, but right. we won't go there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that kind of connection uh, to Duchamp um, and what common commonplace objects and almost the absurdity of saying, well, you know, here's an audio cable, but in this context, it can be a conduit that's channeling into a, a space and it can have a metaphor or another meaning by taking it and utilizing it in a different way. So that was the next step from working with panels was to look more at, ob at, at objects um, around um, listening and particularly objects that dampen or, or um, there's also diffusers that push bounce sound off in, in spaces for concerts and recording. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, let's just keep it moving and let's go old school with uh, Duchamp's inner ear since we are talking about sculpture and um, the influence of Duchamp. <laughs> so we could talk about that and then segue into the blues. Okay. So this piece is titled Duchamp's Inner Ear and that title happened this year and this is a, an object that I actually had in my studio for quite some time and it was definitely a Valerie moment where she was like, what's that over there? And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing with that yet. I don't know what that is. Like, I know what we can do with that. <laughs> <laughs> we can include that in the show because it's so and You already fabulous. had me pulling drawings from under my bed, literally. So. Um, uh, it was just a, a, a perfect, a natural continuation, and, and the title worked well. And the, um, it's a, a Victrola part from 1923. It's got a copyright uh, a patent stamp on the inside, and, and the woodwork. It just it just needed to be represented and reframed. I did very little, but try to uh, re repair some of the the, the years of wear. But um, I won't touch it. But if you hold it up and speak through the bottom part, it has this huge, uh, it just has such a powerful uh, acoustic nature just from how it's designed. Well, it's rare because we always see these of metal, but I've yeah. never seen one in wood and before. I haven't found I haven't found one in wood, and it could just be because there's not a lot that survived, and I imagine like water damage or any changes to temperature would affect that, that wood in a different way. 
Um, but the title was perfect because of the, also the year it was patented, um, dovetailed perfectly into a Duchampian mm -hmm. uh, nod. Um, and w when we were talking earlier about making new work and how we were going to sort of frame up a little bit over a decade, um, I realized that I had never really worked with the color blue and maybe because it, it immediately opens up like the, the biggest uh, uh, reference to Klein, but also because it's just immediately harkens the blues and how, how much of that um, would, would play into this work or not play into the work. And then I like to use titles and let that information live outside of the piece and let the piece sort of be reflective of the title but not a literal rendering. Mm -hmm. um, so we also wanted to wrap up by making uh, this reference to tritone. So by including a new suite of blue pieces, we have, we have red, yellow, blue, we, and we also have this, this three temperatures. Mm -hmm. Right, and I love, uh, I, I totally missed the opportunity to talk about those three temperatures because we went from red to yellow to blue. And uh, we talked about the reverberate, reverberate blah, blah, the, the quality of reverberating uh, with these colors, but can you talk about them as temperatures in terms of red, yellow, and blue? Um, well, not really. Yeah. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, what well, you talked about as we moved around, because we, yeah. we spent some time yeah, they installing have to, that they do have. There's different feelings and different weights to mm -hmm. each space, absolutely. And um, I hope that that sensibility is, conveys something a little bit as ephemeral as that, that sound can convey. Mm -hmm. That Again, going back to that relationship between visual language and oral language, and then you know music history and the title references, and then just the feeling that you get. So. And, and this is a, a, an, a foray into more gestural work exactly. as well. Yeah. And I think that that's a, that's a big leap to start as a painter at the Art Institute of Chicago in like 87 and sort of abandon painting later after being in New York and then come back to it mm -hmm. because I wanted to return to painting with much more intention. And um, painting, I said yesterday, painting is hard and you immediately put on this massive backpack of art history mm -hmm. and you pick up a paintbrush and a thousand paintings flood into, you, in, into your mind and um, part of that is about, you know, hiding something and easing back into painting and using maybe the absorbers are getting smaller and the paintings are getting bigger. And very gestural, so it's a wonderful direction to, uh, to point toward the future of what, what these are going to look like moving forward. Um, so let's move further down and talk about the later drawings and more sculpture. Um, should we do the sculpture first and then allow David to, to come in and, yeah, and do talk about Okay, so let's talk about the song containers and um, this idea of uh, again using the actual uh, modes of listening and the way that uh, listening can occur. Uh, as material itself with the audio cables. Um, so the audio cables actually became an, an, ex in, guys. Uh, an extension of um, more gestural work that was happening with audio tape. We didn't inclu include any of the audio, uh, the tape drawing series. Um, there was not a lot of them. <laughs> but um, uh, I mentioned also yesterday that um, my fascination with with modernist histories and how they're in shaped. Uh, I used to start lectures for students with the flow chart from the first catalog at MoMA with the Alfred Barr's chart to explain to the masses what modernism was. And this flow chart comes out into two channels and those channels were non-geometric and geometric abstraction. And um, I think that sound and conceptual art can live in that space between those two channels. But I spent so much energy working specifically with, um, with geometry, with hard edges, mm -hmm. that um, making something more gestural was a kind of a nod and leaning to, to that other conversation and that gesture is happening in, in the blue mm -hmm. uh, pieces as well. Um, so the, the cable pieces originally happened in an exhibition at Sikkima Jenkins in 2010 called Electric. And so uh, the, the sound piece was uh, slowly in a silent way caged, which is Miles Davis's first electric. It was like Dylan going electric. It was a pretty 
harsh thing and Herbie Hancock's opening chords um, have been um, stretched out digitally to the exact um, time of 433. Mm -hmm. So the other thing is that I, everyone who worked with sound has to get their cage, cage piece out. Yeah. It's like, and then you can move on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it made sense to look for a material that would also reflect that, um, that electric moment and, and, and to bring that gesture in. So that's how, how the birth of the audio cables. And I like that they plug directly into the wall and we were very mindful to have them plug into the pages of the book mm -hmm. so that they have this, um, this very assertive connection. Um, but uh, feeding into the empty white box space um, and then this is a suite, uh, an addition that's never been uh, shown altogether um, until we have Texas-sized space. That's what I say. <laughs> There's space here like never before. Um, and uh, it goes through the incarnation of not all of the ways we packaged and contained um, music and disseminated music, but um, four versions, the cassette, uh, liner notes at the end, then eight track sleeves. 45s and a, st and a standard LP. And I like that, it, that you know, our placement, it ended up sort of falling off and then you turn the corner into a digital realm, into a listening experience that, that doesn't have that tangible relationship. And speaking of listening experiences, oh. David? <laughs> are you, are you, oh, he's here. Um, so the later drawings, um, really become scores, and you um, alluded to this when we were um, on the other side of the gallery. David is here to do something extraordinarily special for us, but um, uh, do you want to talk just briefly about this? Yeah, no, we're stuck. Then we, up, yeah, it was a setup. Uh, <laughs> thank you. David Dove, everybody with Nameless Sound is here, and um, we're happy to have you with us. Um, Okay, so David and I last night got into a, a really wonderful discussion that is probably just the beginning, hopefully, of still talking about these things. And I just said today to him that I get the most insecure with, mu with musicians. <laughs> and um, because I do uh, use terms, and I know that the term graphic score um, at one point had, we were talking being a specific tool, but I tend to use that um, as a term to talk about how I work in a series, to talk about pages, and, and the relationship geometrically to music notation and symbols in music notation as metaphors um, in the sculptures, I mean, in the drawings. So there's two suites um, behind you. This is a score for Melba Liston, who was a trombonist uh, in the big band-ish era. And, uh, and next to that is a series that is a score for Agnes Martin. So I call them scores. They co-opt some things from, from music notation. Um, so our discussion ended up being about interpretation and intention, <laughs> which is good. Um, so he's going to interpret. <laughs> <laughs> and intend. If you want to say. Sh should we talk a little bit first? Or? Okay, well, I have to get my stuff too, so. Um, well, when I first saw these and before we had this conversation last night, uh, my first question for Jenny was, in what way, whether it's intuitive or what type of uh, specific or general intention, even if it was just conceptual or thinking about it, were you imagining someone playing this piece? And the reason I ask this is because I'm, um, well, because I think they're very well written and I'm, I think graphic scores are very important and there's a lot of interesting conversations around them and they're a very important form to what I do, but I think there aren't very many good ones. And it's very interesting uh, for me to hear Jenny say like, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, like they weren't really meant as tools primarily yes. as scores as such. But I think they're very good ones and they're very good ones because they have uh, particular elements uh, that are consistent. They have variations on those elements. And I think the amount of reference to traditional notation is just enough uh, as your forms are just enough. And also maybe just specific enough and just ambiguous enough to be, to be an interesting graphic score. So. Uh, the daunting part of this is that it's from Melba Liston, and she's an amazing trombone player, and I'm not going to try to play like Melba Liston, but let me get my stuff together, all right? Okay. 
Um, so I'll briefly, while he's getting his horn, I'll briefly talk about the last um, pieces here. Uh, this is a suite called Listening Positions at the Hirshhorn, and I'm, again, Valerie allowed me to show something that was edited out of another exhibition that, that should have been uh, shown. So these are from 2011 when I was planning the Hirshhorn exhibition, and that's the curved wall, and just quick gestural studies based on where people might be in that space acoustically while they were experiencing that work. And then this end is uh, a group of 10 from uh, a series of 100 um, called A Score for Sustained Blackness, and it is exactly that. It's about the tenacity and the sustainability of one's blackness. And uh, I started as a very small series, and immediately it had to be 100 drawings that I worked on over this last year. So now there's officially 100. So well, it's, it's, being, it's like 10, yeah. 10 sets of 10. And um, the, the line comes from uh, a German pen for drawing uh, your own uh, s scores. So an, an, another way of looking at a sound wave, but also flipping it and using this, this uh, gesture. <laughs> 